Okay, welcome for the, to the afternoon panel called, I'm going to remind myself what this is called, Microbes, Molds, and Plants Without the Molds. We lost the mold speaker uh, a month ago. Uh, although I think uh, you were a co-author on that mold paper. So we have a little, and we had, and we heard about molds anyway. Um, the way we're going to do this is there were two speakers, unlike the other sessions when there were th where there were three, there were two speakers. What I'm going to ask the speakers to do first is to very briefly summarize what they said, because you're not necessarily the same people who are here this morning, and who knows wh who was and wasn't online. So in, in a very short point, in a very, very short span, please summarize with a view to the following, not only to inform them what the issues are that we're going to discuss, but to the fact that I'm going to be asking you and Art to agree and disagree on some of these points with one another. So mention the points where it's relevant to know whether you and Art see eye to eye. Go ahead and bring this, please, very close to you. OK, my, my name, hello, my name is Frantis Bolska. I was having today the talk on plants. And maybe I think most of you was here. So I just briefly summarize the plants are more complex as generally accepted. They have a lot of knowledge about their environment. The, especially the flowering plants interact with the insects, uh, animals, uh, even mammals, in order to survive and to help them with the sexual reproduction especially. And uh, they use for this interaction several, several tools or means uh, which are mostly based on uh, their very nice chemistry so they are able to produce volatiles of different kinds which can manipulate behavior of insects and animals also they use uh, some other cues like a special especially with the flowers special forms and special colors and shapes which are attractive somehow for prospective pollinators and of course, they designed also the fruits which should be eaten and in order to spread their seeds. So uh, the flowering plants are somehow relying on animals for their propagation. And so I, my focus is on the roots on this, in this prospect. And the roots are the more active part of the plants, which is more on the social level interested. And there are many. Uh, nice examples like mycorrhiza symbiosis or even bacteria symbiosis which I was not mentioning in my talk and in the roots uh, according to Charles Darwin theory of the so-called root brain our data confirm many of these uh, speculative uh, issues and we have this special zone there where the cells are focusing on sensory perceptions and controlling the navigation of the root growth in order to find the nutrition and water and avoid dangerous toxic patches. So there is uh, in the root apex something which seems to be similar to the sensory motoric circuits, which drives and navigate a root growth in the soil. Okay, that's all. Uh, and, the, and the core question, which is, do you consider plants to be sentient organisms? From all data we have and we also are published in literature, my feeling, but this is my feeling, is that they are sentient in their plant-specific way. So it is not similar sentience we have in our human society situation, but there must be some, some kind of sentience which allows them to act uh, online according to the context of the situation and which allows them to manipulate several insects, for example, for their own benefit. Uh, I have to follow up further. The, the uh, article on which a lot of this is based, uh, where's Jim? Where's Jim Simmons? Is he, ah, there you are, okay. Is, uh, was, uh, what does it feel like to be a bat? And you spoke about echolocation in plants. And I ask you, does it feel like something for a plant to echolocate? Yeah, so this was also based on a very, simple experiment and uh, if the echolocation is really there it's uh, still a question but i would be surprised if it is not there if the root 
of maize is producing these very regular clicking sounds that it would be not used for some kind of echolocation. Uh, I, the, the question wasn't whether they echolocate, but whether if they echolocate, do they feel? Does it feel like something yes. for a mess, for, for a So with respect to feelings, it is a difficult question because we cannot ask them, but if the plant is stressed, it responds immediately with a response which is uh, somehow relieving this problem. And the plants under stress also generates pain-killing substances or substances having anesthetic actions in humans and animals. So one could expect that they are having some feelings of a very bad situation and they try to improve it. Thank you. Now, Arthur, could you summarize? Um, bacteria are conscious. Is that enough? Do you want more? A little bit more, please. <laughs> Um, there, there are certain hallmarks uh, that we usually regard as um, compelling evidence of sentience. Uh, it consists of the ability to learn, to uh, store memories, make decisions, express emotions, um, react to specific uh, aspects of the environment based upon uh, the valence of the events that you encounter, uh, to communicate and interestingly, to care for each other. And all of these behaviors are manifested in prokaryotes, in the simplest organisms uh, on the planet. And um, the uh, ongoing search for centuries, which has intensified in the last several decades, to try to answer what David Chalmers infamously called the hard problem, uh, have kind of foundered on all sorts of problems, both scientific and philosophical. <clears throat> but this suggestion that I'm putting forward here uh, resolves almost all of those problems and difficulties and invites a reorientation of the scientific enterprise and a shift in the way in which philosophers of mind approach these various issues. And how it's does that resolve it? What? How does it resolve it? Just so we know what you're saying. Well, it resolves it in neutralizing it and that the problem becomes one of uh, relatively um, unimportance in terms of um, the drive for epistemological uh, insight and understanding. And as I was saying earlier and talking with some folks about this, it's, it's like, I mean, did cognitive psychology, you know, solve behaviorism? It, it didn't, but it resolved it. It took most of the issues that were being raised within the context of behaviorism reformulated them, put them in another framework, added additional scaffolding upon which to build theory and where to look for the next important empirical insights. And so it resolved it. So okay. I see my work as, you know, this, this approach and as resolving the, the hard problem. Let me give you a, a cartoon example to test whether it's resolved it. I mean, this is super simplified, but all the essentials are there. We have a gamut of organisms on the planet. You're not a panpsychist, so you think sentience stops with or living organisms, so we don't have to go to rocks. We have a gamut of organisms, and we have some dedicated and I think very decent people who think that if an organism feels, and more particularly if you can, if they, if they, if they feel negative, have negative valenced feelings, as you would call it, uh, you shouldn't harm them. Uh, supposing you, you, you can disagree with that, but supposing you did feel that, uh, would it follow that, that we shouldn't harm any living organism? There's no distinction between sentient ones and insentient ones? Uh, well, since all organisms, from my perspective, are sentient, uh, the answer can be focused on that component. I take a utilitarian stance along the lines that, uh, um, that Singer does, and, oh, come on, brain, I'm blocking on the... Uh, the British uh, ethicist has been uh, putting forward a fairly sophisticated utilitarian point of view. I'll, rem I'll remember it when the session's over. Uh, <clears throat> there, there are no simple answers here. Um, every time you, you, know, you stop in, uh, in inflicting some suffering on one species or organism, you end up uh, with secondary uh, losses in various other contexts. Um, you have to look at you know, the, the overall larger perspective in terms of society the human condition and the ethical considerations involved in it. Uh, I'm a big fan of reducing suffering wherever it's possible. 
Uh, I take the precautionary principle seriously. I think that the people who argue that fish don't feel pain are out of their minds. Um, and, and I think that the, the, the commercial and um, uh, industrial elements that get involved in these issues contaminate the discourse and make it harder to carry out. People come into these with uh, fairly well-constructed um, alternate visions about what they think is right and wrong. And it wasn't quite what I meant. Let me okay. say it another way. Well, the people who worry about this yes. notice that there's a lot of different species. They're simply asking, their worry, the one that you're going to resolve is, which one should we worry about? Are you answering all of them? We should try to reduce suffering every time that we can. But the, the, the brutal truth of it is every organism survives by consuming other organisms. They kill them and they eat them or they let somebody else do the killing and then they hang around for the eating. So, you know, there's no way that we're going to completely eliminate this. Yeah, the question but, is to take the utilitarian perspective. Okay, so uh, let, let's, let's now ask the question, what do Frantisek and Arthur agree on and what do you disagree on? I can answer that dead simple. The more we talk to each other, the more we agree with each other. We started out disagreeing a couple of months ago. Um, we started exchanging emails. He started making very compelling arguments, sending me links to um, various research that's gone on in his field. He, I ended up in some fairly extended and rather engaging debates with friends and colleagues of his. And I'm, move, I'm feeling more and more comfortable with his point of view. I, I do feel that there is an edginess to some of the work that's being done that gives me uh, skepticism, is that the right word? A, a sense that I'd like to wait for a bit and assume a more agnostic line until the evidence is more compelling. That, that's worked well in the past, you know, so I think I'll continue doing that. Frantisek, is that the same, is that, does that description fit you regarding Arthur's work? Yes, yes. So we are now, I think, on the same wave. Okay, same wave. Okay. Now I introduce Mike Hendricks, who's who's already uh, spoken here, to be the first discussant. Sure. Um, I found both talks really compelling, and and if you were here for my talk, you know that I spoke of uh, things like consciousness and and sentience as things that uh, I don't see as properties of brains or organisms. I see them as processes or things these these brains can do. And we all have the experience of our own consciousness and our own feelings. They vary over time, they vary in strength. Sometimes they're absent. We can be completely without consciousness. Even when we're wide awake, there are lots of aspects of our brain's activity of which we are not conscious in the sort of day-to-day uh, -day sense, right? In fact, most of what we do, we are not conscious of. And this gives me a hard time uh, thinking of all living things of being sentient or conscious um, in the sense that even most of what we are is not sentient or conscious unless we go down and consider uh, this sort of Russian nesting doll of sentience where the cells in an organism are, are separately conscious and then you have to think, well, the mitochondria within the cells are separately conscious and it sort of regresses in a difficult way. Um, but the, the main problem I had with Art's approach, and maybe he can address this, was, uh, um, okay, so there's this famous criticism of Dan Dennett's book, Consciousness Explained, that it should have been called Consciousness Explained Away. So he really didn't explain what it was. He just sort of got rid of it in his explanations of how the mind works. And I worry a little bit about that with sentience here and its relationship to the hard problem. Uh, if everything is, is sentient, it's kind of the same thing as saying nothing it is. If it's a universally shared property and it doesn't distinguish between kinds of organisms or levels of organization, it's hard to see how it does much explanatory work. And I think Chalmers' formulation of the hard problem, obviously I don't agree with his answer, I think dualism is hopeless, but the hard problem still remains because you can have a complex set of behaviors uh, that don't require sentience, yet when we you know, withdraw our hand from a fire and we cradle our hand, it hurts. And that's the thing he's trying to explain. Why does it hurt? Not why did we do all these things, not why all these nerve impulses resulted in that behavior, but why does it hurt? Why does it feel like something? Um, and I think that even if you say everything has this capacity to some degree or another, uh, you still haven't explained the hard problem the way he sees it, which is this uh, subjectivity. Uh, sorry you weren't here this morning. I, I, I try to address every one of those so I, I was issues. here, but I Were you here? Oh, you heard yeah, what I said. Yeah, yeah. You, didn't, you obviously didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> which is okay, that's fine. No, I, I, what I, with the, the question of um, these, these multiple representations inside a, a complex organism, I mean, there, there are two big problems there. And, 
Uh, one of them is how do you get multicellular species from singular cellular species? And the other one is how does a multicellular species come to have a singular or uh, a subjectivity, given the fact that it has all of these complex cells, cells, each one of which is in principle sentient itself? I think the answer to the first one is going to be uh, discovered by microbiologists, and they're working on it, and I don't know what it is, and I know it's not relevant to my argument. The second one is, and the second one I think is, um, should be viewed from the point of view of um, individual functions that individual cells and groups of cells and collectives of cells take on. So that you can imagine that as you get a, uh, a more complex multicellular organism, that it becomes highly efficient for them to subdivide the, the, uh, um, the needs, uh, the jobs, the functions. So the one cluster of cells becomes the sensory they pick up sensory components. In other words, become the nociceptive cells. Others become the representational cells, the ones that provide subjectivity to the organism. And so what you end up with is a unitary consciousness with a cluster of other functions that are taking place unconsciously. And uh, again, I, I try to deal with this guy that's so long ago. I like started publishing this stuff in the early 80s and tried to bring it together in a book in the 90s. Um, if you look at the cognitive system, uh, a really good way to uh, to view it is you have um, a top-down explicit system. We're talking about humans now. And you have a bottom-up implicit system. And the implicit system takes place independent of the top-down. It acquires a great deal of information. It's very effective. Uh, and, I, and I called it implicit learning. Others have other terms for it, like procedural learning. Um, but it, it takes place independent of, of, of human consciousness in the sense that these specific clusters of cells, which have evolutionarily emerge to handle the consciousness for homo sapiens, they're doing their thing while this other stuff is underneath it. The other stuff that's underneath it is your bladder, your liver, your intestines, all these things are all handling these things at an unconscious level. It all contributes to the emergence of the organ or the organism itself. Now, where you gain from what I'm calling the CBC model, which is named in honor of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, um, it stands for cell, cellular basis of consciousness. What I'm arguing is that the consciousness that we have in human beings is on an evolutionary continuum that goes back to the origins of life. But it's got to be organic. You can't just carry out the computations. And um, you're not going to get sentience in, in uh, a toaster. You're not going to get subjectivity in uh, an AGI, in an artificial general intelligence either. Um, that's another set of arguments. It brings in John Searle and this Chinese room and all of the objections to it. I don't think we need to go down that. But from my perspective, ignoring the hardware is a mistake. The system is extremely hardware or software or wetware, whatever you want to call it, extremely sensitive. And once you remove that component, you're in trouble. Now, quickly, back to Chalmers. What Chalmers is really talking about from a philosophical point of view is how, how the brain makes the mind, how matter makes mental. I'm a huge fan of the cognitive neurosciences. Every time somebody finds another component within the brain that modulates, mediates, or in some way cooperates with particular kinds of cognitive functions, I, I applaud. I just think this is wonderful stuff. But that's not the resolution of the hard problem. Because the resolution of the hard problem is not going to come by starting with homo sapiens. This is where Frantisek and I agree. It's going to start when you look at it, the most fundamental basis where it first shows up. Just like Candell showed you can learn a lot about memory going back and looking at Ecclesia Californica or the people who um, got some powerful insights into the visual system made huge progress by looking at the omatidia of, horse, of horseshoe crabs. I want to push it back as far as I can where it's scientifically coherent and sensible where there are falsifiable hypotheses and uh, mechanisms that can be uncovered. I, I, so I want to totally agree. I believe these problems get resolved or sort of dissolved with these sort of ground up uh, smaller scale explanations and data gathering. I think I alluded to that with uh, Francois Jacob in my talk. I mentioned he said, uh, we've never gotten anywhere asking big questions, but we always get to the answers of the big questions by asking a bunch of little questions underneath. And I think that's, that's absolutely right. Um, I want to bring up one other aspect of sort of consciousness and self-awareness and perhaps sentience 
that I raised in my talk because um, many systems, including non-living systems, can exhibit complex, dynamic, nonlinear behavior. They can they can be homeostatic or rheostatic. They can respond. They can adapt over time. Um, so it's hard to to pick which characteristics we decide mean something alive. Even that boundary between living things and non-living things is is not agreed upon. Viruses, uh, which may have evolved from something like a bacteria, so may have actually evolved from living organisms to become things that are questionable. Um, there's always these sort of interstitial cases where we can't quite decide. Um, what I proposed was that for something to have a sense of self-awareness at all, in any uh, sense that would give rise to consciousness, subjectivity, uh, or sentience, a necessary condition is that it have, have a way to compare uh, models, either forward models or some sort of predictive model, uh, some internal self-representation to the outside world. And that's because you have to be able to integrate action and perception if you're a behaving organism. You have to know which sensory input are resulting from your own actions and, and what they were predicted to be versus what's ex-afferent, things that are just impinging on your system. And the reason it concerns me if a system doesn't seem to have that is I don't see where an organism so let me give you an example. So a plant, if a plant will rotate its leaves to follow the sun throughout the day, right, to maximize the exposure of the leaves. Um, but to a plant, it's the same thing as having its pot rotated as rotating the leaf itself. It doesn't, e either way, it's the same sensory experience. So for a monkey, though, if I put a monkey on a turntable uh, and I turn the turntable, that's an extremely different experience for the monkey than the monkey turning its head to change its visual field because it has an internal model that's based on vestibular feedback, based on prediction of moving its muscles and its eyes. Um, and it tells it when those are in conflict with the real world. And I think it's out of this conflict that we can generate an internal representation and a, and a sense that we have a self that is in opposition to the outside world. So I feel like in, in some organisms, single-celled organisms, for example, I study a worm with 302 neurons. I gave an example of one internal self-representation, but I also gave examples of behaviors that don't require that kind of representation. Uh, I think it's really questionable whether it's even possible to have the kind of internal model that allows a sense of self uh, to arise. I wonder if the plant... Fantasec deserves a... Yeah, I think... Yes, so for, for the plant, for example, I can... Okay, there are, there are many examples in my talk. I can mention now, for example, orchids mimicking for the male I forgot the name of this uh, wasp or bumblebee, or the gay. they mimic the female, which is uh, such a perfect model that the male is absolutely convinced that this is a female ready to copulate, and he tries to copulate even many times. So the, uh, there is no reward in the point of view of uh, nectar there. This is just a fooling the male of this insect, and um, there must be some perfect model in this plant which can mimic perfectly this female insect. But of course, uh, from the point of, of cells, even in the bacteria, like here we are hearing, so they must have some kind of model of environment, otherwise they would be not surviving and they would be not able to adapt in order to somehow survive. So they need to have some kind of model. How it is generated is a mystery, but they must have some model, I think. I guess my answer to that is, is you don't need to be alive or to have a model to have homeostatic or rheostatic ex responses to the external environment. Yes, but this is, this is, you know, flexible behavior which can be changed according to context. So your refrigerator will not respond to the context. It will be just doing repeatedly what is programmed for. But this living system, even bacteria, are very flexible in their responses and behavior according to context of situation, what they experience. Could I bring in another speaker? Um, uh, first, I want to introduce Greg uh, um, Dudek, who is the who, who is the head of the Mobile Robotics Laboratory at at McGill. Could you uh, take up this question in terms of internal representations in mobile robots? Sure. So I have to sort of apologize initially for not only coming late but missing all the talks this morning, which sound fascinating. Um, yeah, so I work on building artificial systems that try to capture elements of intelligence. And I'm sure, as everybody knows, intelligence has been, you know, something that the computer science community has chased after for a long time. And every time we think we've defined it and then solve that problem, we realize, oh, that was the wrong definition, and we move on to another one. 
Um, and so I think in practice, in, within the computer science, robotics, AI world, I'd say by and large people don't use the word intelligence very much because it seems to refer Neither to... Neither do we. We haven't said it. Well, you know, but it's true. But, you know, now I think we're using the word sentience or consciousness. And but are they synonymous? They're not synonymous, but I'm not sure they're going to... I guess where I'm going is I'm, think, I'm thinking they're going to be elusive in similar kinds of ways. Um, so you asked me to talk about representation um, and the extent to which having a representation relates to being sentient. And I would say essentially all of the robots I work with and all the ones my colleagues develop are, have some internal representation both of where they are and what the world is like, and yet I would never go so far as to call them sentient nor conscious. Uh, nor intelligent, for that matter. Although many people are starting to use that word informally in the in the everyday world, uh, you know, my sense is these terms often refer to an agglomeration of properties. Um, and I'll I'll give one example of a of a system which is, I believe, has a representation but isn't sentient by any reasonable measure. And it's you know, when I was a kid, I was started to get interested in AI quite young before I had a computer. And so I built a machine that could learn to play some checkers like game out of matchboxes, and it's a, it's a kind of fascinating mechanism. You take all the possible configurations of the game you want to play, and for every possible move, you put a bead inside a matchbox. So each matchbox represents one state of the world, and each bead represents one thing you can do. And then you play this game by taking a matchbox that matches what you see, taking a move, and you successfully can select moves from these boxes. And finally, if the computer, if we call it that, loses, you take the last bead that it had in it and you throw that bead in the garbage and it can never make that bad move again. And so eventually you end up with a collection of matchboxes that play some game perfectly. Um, and so you have the beads are the, the, the beads are the boxes jointly are the representation of the world. In some sense, the representation of the state of the system itself. It actually does a task, but clearly it's not really sentient or intelligent or any of those nice things. Say so yeah, I, I, I was going to say, let's move a little bit higher than worms, but not quite to the animals that we were discussing in the, in the, in the uh, rest of the um, uh, summer school, to Lars and bees. All right. Um, so my name's Lars Chitka. I work with insects. Um, insects, of course, historically have been um, classified as the sort of quint quintessential mindless reflex machines. Can you all hear me? A little close. Okay. Um, so I think it's been well recognized that things like ants and bees and wasps and so on are pretty impressive in terms of having a large instinctual repertoire that allows them to um, build elaborate nest constructions and, and um, hexagonal honeycombs that are mathematically optimal, um, that they have uh, elaborate task allocation where some individuals specialize in some and others in other tasks and um, regulate the climate in the colony and all kinds of impressive things. But people have always thought that this is largely uh, a t based on a toolbox, a, a repertoire of hardwired routines that were all inflexible. And that's all there is, that all the complexity somehow um, arises from extremely well-programmed automatons. Yeah, in fact, let's use the, the conventional word, robots. He said, they're just robots, just so you should hear it. Yeah, uh, you could call it uh, that. Well, I mean, I'd say, for Greg's mm -hmm. sake, I said robots. Except for uh, Darwin. No, da Darwin was famously um, complimentary about him. Um, well, I mean, they're, they're not, they, they may be, I, I'm, sort of, I'm just trying to tweak Steve because um, they're, they're not robots because they don't evolve. Robots evolve. That's my. Well, yes, but they evolve with with top down, and you're the top. No, no, but there are people now. Who have yeah, no. That adapt over they, time. This is true. Physically. This is true. This is true. But is it doing based upon natural selection? Are epigenetic components involved? How many times are you going to move the goalposts until they end up synonymous with uh, with uh, genetics and Darwin? We're, we're, since we agreed that we were going to talk about processes instead of sentience. We're talking about processes. These processes are being implemented in robotics today. The things that you pointed to in plants, they have their homologs in robotics today. They, there are things that are missing. They don't have membranes, as you said. By the way, maybe I should ask you now, what is the magic of membranes in all of this? I know that that's the... Of the membranes? Yeah. Uh, so that's my view. My view is uh, that the membrane is absolutely essential for the biological consciousness. If there will be some robotic consciousness, it will be not based on membranes, and it will be a different consciousness. 
So the biological one is absolutely based on excitable membranes, which somehow, I don't know why, but uh, how it is, but they are somehow essential for this biological consciousness and sentience uh, and also cognition. What is happening in biorobotics? Are, they, are we synthesizing membranes? So there are a small, there is a small community of people who are trying to take biological mechanisms, such as membranes, and try to build what I'll call, in quotes, intelligent systems out of those. And intelligence in this very circumscribed notion, things that you can do some very simple computation, so a blob of stuff that can you know, move towards a light source or move along the table, um, using essentially biological machinery. Um, but that's, so to choose membranes as the, as the dividing line seems uh, um, not to be rude, but seems surprisingly arbitrary to me. Uh, one issue with the membranes is that they generate something which is uh, outside and inside. And I think this uh, dichotomy outside-inside is the starting point where the even unicellular system can generate model of the environment inside. So the inside is uh, this barrier outside-inside, and especially with the membranes, excitable, and what is important, the water. Water must be also there for biological consciousness. I'm not sure I followed that. Um, so, I mean, lots of things have an inside and an outside, and you could also add water to them, and in fact, they might not be alive. So I think yes. we have to be, be a little careful with um, the inflationary usage of big terms like sentience and consciousness. So I think that there are two things that we need to avoid. One, one is the kind of um, arrogance that every researcher has based on their unique. So the primate people look down on the bird people, and the bird people look down on the insect people, and the insect people look down on the elephant people and, and the plant people. That, of course, or, or, or their particular delivery of what consciousness or sentience is. Um, and I think we, th that's a mistake, but the, the other extreme is also a mistake. The other is to just follow the general trend and say, well, we, we've added most vertebrates, maybe invertebrates, oh, let's just add everything in consciousness everywhere. So I think it needs to be, we need to retain stringent criteria um, that, that can be applied across species in some sort of way. And, and I think we, we have to be fairly clear that we can't, for example, classify evolutionary adaptations, such as a plant generating flowers whose characteristics have been selected over many, many generations to benefit the plant and, and, and trick the pollinator as the same kind of phenomenon that, uh, by which an animal invents or a human invents a tool. They're different phenomena. And in the same way, not everything that has an inside and an outside and water inside has sentience. No, in this uh, comment, I was just speaking about cellular life. So all the life which we have on this planet is based on cells. So we don't know any other life. That was my point. Can I get this? Okay, but we're not, we're not attempting to <coughs> define living systems. No, no, I was just trying phenomenon. to explain that this inside-outside on the basis of the membrane is what is, in my view, I don't say this is a true, in my view, this is the fundamental issue for the life. And that's why cells are critical, and we have only several life on this planet. There is no other life without cells. There is no life. We, at least we don't know. Even viruses, if they are outside of the cell, they behave as a dead molecule. As they enter the cell, they start to act, and they start to act as a living system, controlling, manipulating the cells. So I think the cellular basis of the life on this planet, maybe on other planets is different kind of life, I don't know, but here it is a cellular life based on the cell, which is enclosed with the phospholipid bilayer, able to protect the cell, but also to act as a sensory system and also to be system which is able to induce some adaptive changes according to the situation where the cell is in that point of uh, the history of the cell.
but the question was not about life, it was about sentience. The membrane, you asked me about membranes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I understand the association between membranes and life, but the question is what's the association between membranes and sentience? I don't know, no one knows. Okay, let me, let me make a suggestion. I want to invite, before I invite general questions, I want to invite Carol and Jim to go to the microphones if they feel that they have something to say on this subject. <laughs> right, that was uh, quite a move. Um, yeah, I think it's a very interesting discussion. But, 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 what bothers me a bit is the use of all sorts of terms. So, for instance, in the talk by, uh, by Art, can you hear me? Yeah. In the talk by Art, um, you define a number of things which are connected to consciousness or sentience, like learning, communication, and a couple of other things. And then you go to bacteria and you show that they do certain things. They, you can train them in a way to respond to environmental stimuli. And the same with the plants. I mean, yes, they respond to environmental stimuli. And some of the phenomena you see are sort of comparable to what we call learning in our human context. Now the danger or the, yeah, my worry is that by using these terms, we are inferring that somehow the underlying processes of these phenomena are similar across organisms, or produce a sort of awareness or consciousness or sentience, which is also comparable among organisms. And I'm not sure what to make of it. I'm not sure whether you want to push it in that direction, or whether you need to push it in that direction. Why not just accept they do things which look like learning, but let's call it, it looks like learning. It's like learning, but it is not learning in the conventional way or the daily uses of uh, learning. So I'm a bit worried that terms are sort of confusing the whole discussion because terms are loaded because we use them in our human context. Greg, is, is learning a problematic term for you? So I, not for me, but I would have a very expansive notion of learning. I would say my machines learn, even simple take, machines. Take the, take the mic. Really? I bet they can hear me up there. I can even talk louder. The TV. Oh, all right. So, so my, I have a very broad notion of learning, and so I would say even very simple kinds of machines learn. Um, so it's not problematic, in, but it's, it's problematic in a different sense in that I think if you want to have a no, different notion of something which is more human-like, then that's not the same thing that I think of as learning. You know, I think these are very subjective terms, much like art and beauty and trust. We've worked on, on human robot trust, right? And trust, it's interesting, it's, it's a simpler idea, but it has many different kinds of meanings societally and, and pragmatically. And, I think and, that's exactly my point, that yeah. learning has many different meanings. I have no problem with, you, uh, with computers learning things, as long as I don't infer that it's occurring in the same way as it is with humans. And the, and the point now is that I think that we are sort of, if a phenomenon looks like learning, there is a whole connotation of other things which are connected to it. Okay. And, that we, uh, and, and then we say, okay, bacteria can learn, computers can learn, and humans can learn. So it's all learning, we all learn, so we are all equal. Well, can, can and I, I think that's my worry. I, 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 I can address that. Um, there's a big problem with that one. Uh, and it, 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 it invites committing a category error. And it suggests that in fact, two things that are probably mere tokens of a larger type are two um, separate types. And, it, and it, it also invites another even deeper problem, which is the emergentist's dilemma. Some point you're gonna have to identify why this mechanical thing that doesn't really feel like real learning uh, no longer is the operative mechanism, but some new one has popped in here. This new one is the one that has subjectivity and sentience and understanding, or uh, to use Dan Dennett's distinction between uh, competence and comprehension. And suddenly you shift from mere competence to having genuine comprehension. That's a big step. And you're gonna have to identify a cluster of underlying 
molecular and biological uh, elements, it suddenly pops in so that here you don't have it and one cosmic moment later you do have it. What happens in there? And not only with that, you're going to have to have a different one for each species. You're going to have to have a different mechanism for each particular function you're looking at. You're going to have one for memory, you're going to have one for learning, one for decision making. And so you're going to end up with a crazy quilt cluster of deep problems, all of which are resolved by assuming it starts once and everything else evolves from there. It's all one type with a multiplicity of tokens in how it gets instantiated. The changes occur over time. They occur with evolutionary mechanisms pushing them. They have adaptive components to it. They're essential for survival of each individual species. And you have a new platform for looking at this that really simplifies the issues. That's the point I'm trying to make. So why does it have to be something you have or don't? Uh, because, as Carol just put it, in one case it's just a mechanistic operation, and in another it's one that has sentience. He's uncomfortable with taking this sentience notion and driving it all the way back. I no, want to no, drive I'm it. Not, I'm not. I'm not uncomfortable with that at all. Oh, you're so not. I think. I think that point makes sense. The question is that the implication to many people, if you start talking it about it in that way, is that they think it's all equal and that your sort of sentience is the same as the sentience of bacteria and the examples you provided of sort of seemingly sensuous actions in bacteria and the seemingly sensuous actions we have or any other organism or computers may have that they're all sort of similar they're all sentience and my, pro my question, so my problem is that you're sort of unifying things which are not unifiable. And we have to accept it that the sentience of humans and the sentience of a bacteria is very different. It's not denying that there's nothing, that, that, that it's completely, uh, that it's a completely different uh, descriptive phenomenon. I won't deny it. I don't believe that, really. Like, I think sentience is, is, is a subjective attribute. And, there are, and if we want to be a reductionist, I think we should take it and break it down into a set of processes, a set of mechanisms, and those mechanisms we can tra trace back. But sentience, at least for me, I think is, a, is a, a collective phenomenon, and it's very hard to define, like beauty, like trust, like these other things. But because I can't define it, doesn't mean I'm willing to drive it back all the way down to some extremely primitive component and say that alone is sentience. Because then I, have to, then I have to accept that my machines are sentient, by the way. And I think there is a challenge, as, as an aside, for all of us here. You know, these machines, these robots, things like robots, are getting you know, smarter all the time. So this issue that we're looking at, of course, has tremendous implications for the society as a whole. Because it's not just plants, it's everything that's going to end up sort of crossing this boundary very soon. Uh, one of the, the interesting things, and, and Gregory, tell me if I've, if I've been reading the literature correctly. When I look at the work that people are doing in AGI, um, uh, the deep learning folks, the uh, uh, counterfactual uh, uh, maximization mechanisms that have kicked in, that I, I love them. Um, nobody talks about sentience. They don't talk about understanding. They talk about making sure the program works. They talk about looking at the particular focus that, that, that they're aiming at. Um, no one thinks <clears throat> that um, the, uh, the um, new poker bot that came out of the CMU gang knows anything about poker. Uh, it's just carrying out computations. But when you read the stuff that's coming out from the journalists, especially the, the fairly sophisticated science journalists, they're dotting all of their writings with words like understanding motivation, desire, the, the robot wants. And they're just injecting all of these anthropomorphic components in it. Is that right? Is that what you see that going on? That, that... I said to use the microphone at the top before they yeah, to Stephen. Yeah, I agree completely. Uh, I don't think people use sentience or intelligence very much technically because they're so subjective, they're so hard to define, and they've 
and they've proven to be very elusive. And they tend to refer, I think, in practice now to a huge collection of attributes that no single system has in practice. And I don't think we've had that much success so far in building any kind of AGI, like general intelligence. And so also, and, and uh, yeah, so journalists, I guess, do that in every domain though, right? You know, you know conflate a lot of things, say it makes exaggerated statements, and that's a bit of a danger. Fake news. But I think no, journal journalists are right to do news. that in the sense it's that- It's called selling newspapers. I don't think those things are wrong to do in the sense that, that these robots are designed intentional systems at least. We give them goals, we give them models to compare the world to. And that's how I think we have to also separate things that are intentional systems from things that are you know, intelligent or sentient or conscious systems. I think they're very separate properties. Like living and dead things can have uh, sort of an intentional point of view on the world and, a way, and ways in which they respond to the what world. What do you mean conflict. intentional? So I, this goes back to Dennett again. There's, there's as if intentionality, design intentionality, all these things. It's basically a property we confer on something that, that acts as if it's an agent in the world. So it it's, gets back to you. This is the best way to explain how things in the world behave the way they do, how to guess what an animal is going to do, how to, is to ascribe to it the kind of intentionality uh, that it's making decisions the way you would in the world, I think, roughly. Yeah, well then, yep. Intentionality is usually expressed in the sense of aboutness. That is a mental state that is about something that is out there. Uh, so I have little doubt that um, my cat has intentionality, and I have equally little doubt, despite <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at Carol's eyes, uh, I have little doubt that a uh, a prokaryote has intentionality. Well, okay, that says I, I agree a lot that it about... has intentionality. They could design intentionality. I don't think it has any intelligence or sentient stuff. Okay, let's not get too ecumenical about all this. We're not agreeing, okay? We're, 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 we're hail fellow well, well met, but we're not agreeing. You said intentionality is something we project. That's not what we're talking about over here. We're talking about something that the animal has, not something that we project Dennett like. The, it thinks it's one, it, it, it thinks it needs to get its queen so out early. I still have a problem with it being something animals have versus it being something animals do, these kinds of... Well, yeah. when I pinch you and it hurts, is that something you do? It's something, yes. I think it's something Hurting is something doing. you do? It's something my brain's doing. Yeah. Well, yes, we all, we're not I mean, dualists. Not that my brain doesn't... But yeah. We're not dualists. We all agree it's something your brain's doing. I'm talking about what you're doing. When something hurts, is it something you're doing or something you're feeling? because it's whether you're feeling that's at issue over here. It's not something I'm projecting onto you. You either are or you aren't. There's a question about degree of sentience this morning, irrelevant. We're not talking about how much you feel, how hard it feels, whether you can see, see colors or not see colors. We're talking about whether you feel anything at all, whether it feels like anything to be in the state that you're in. Sure, I, I think that's a behavior, fundamentally. That's what? A behavior. I, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like it's like having inner speech or a thought or or uh, imagining the future. It's it's a internal behavior. Okay, grab the microphone. Put it. It's like it. wait, hurting is like imagining the future. That seems no, it, like there's a, there's a category of behaviors that aren't motor behaviors, right? They're mental behaviors, they're mental states. I think experience of feeling is, is expressing a mental behavior. It happens over a discrete period of time. It involves the engagement of certain neurons. It involves probably some control of your body's physiology. It's, it's, it's a behavior. The feeling you get of being afraid can't be separated from the, from the feeling of adrenaline entering your bloodstream and your heart rate going up. That's a behavior. Well, at, at its basic level, nociception is not necessarily a behavior. You no don't need, is not. Pain is. Well, pain is is Bring the sentient course. element to no deception, and of course you can, at least in theory, get get no deception. You can get withdrawal responses from noxious stimuli without there being any kind of awareness, Absolutely. and and vice versa to some extent. I can tell you an, a, an example. Just a few days ago, I was up in the Laurentide. Um, and you got all kinds of wonderful stinging insects there. Anyway, so I got out of a car two minutes later, walked in the house, and everyone pointed at me and said, what happened to you? And so I just uh, s smacked a hu huge horsefly on, the, on my head, um, which had already filled itself completely with my blood, so it looked quite <laughs> dramatic. I had not noticed. I had not been aware. The moment someone told me, it actually hurt. 
So that's a beautiful example of the, the interplay between pain and the awareness of pain and the, 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 the sentient element of it. You can get a perfect adaptive response without any form of awareness. So and that, 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 not necessarily, but the, but the point is that these are two separate things. And I mean, for practical purposes, it's important to disentangle them. So I think you can get adaptive responses to such stimuli without there necessarily being Absolutely. suffering, for example. Although not to play just devil's advocate, but you know, if you think of all those Ramachandran experiments where people without an arm feel intense pain, and then through some cognitive process, they exorcise that pain. You know, it does suggest that the boundary between these reflexive behaviors and the conscious ones is somewhat porous. So you know, I think you're, you're almost slipping toward dualism, right, Doug? You're saying there's a difference between a cognitive process and, and something that's real. They're all just neurons firing. Well, we can agree on that. Uh, yeah. Okay, at this point, I think we can open up to questions from the outside as well. The outside. There's a lot of students. Uh, you just said uh, the feeling you get as a behavior. Did I get that right? We were talking about like the brain does. Sure. The behavior, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So the feeling you get as a behavior, we are trying to get away. Uh, away from the dualistic view of our ancestors, right? Um, but still, how do we define who you is in that sentence? The feeling you get. Right, I always have this problem too. Like, you know, there are these right. supposed free will experiments where people mm -hmm. see some uh, brain activity that precedes the sort of consciously reportable intention to do something by seconds or something. And people say it's a evidence against free will and you're not controlling yourself. But you know, your whole brain is you, right? There's just a, a subset of it that you have conscious access to. So I don't think it's falling into dualism to say that. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not in, in no way implying that you're falling in dualism. Sorry if I sounded like that. The dualism but is a loaded I mean word, is, but I got to interject that, you know, I think most computer scientists, or at least roboticists, may actually ascribe to dualism in some sense, in the sense that. <laughs> The hardware and the software are fundamentally different. And I do believe that I can take the software out of one computer and put it into another. And that second computer is the thing now. And the first computer is just that box. And I, you know, I'm a little bit of a raised Kurzweil guy in the sense that I'm willing to accept the possibility that that is true for me too. On the right box, if you can extract all those connections and run it, I'll be in there now. Of course, all those will be over here. So then, then in that case, what's the difference between moving you and copying you? Where that's are you a, if I copy it? That's a fantastic other debate, which we can have for a long time. Uh, but Never mind. We're off topic. So. <laughs> well, I just, I just argue that because our language, common, the way we commonly speak, comes from somewhere, right, from the past. And we're still using those words, and we can't get rid of the, the we still think like that, even though we don't want to be dualists. It's very hard to get rid of, and uh, it probably permeates our, our uh, even as hard as we may try not to be dualists. It's very hard to get rid of. Yeah, that was my Usually, only point. Dualism is talking about different kinds of stuff. They're just fundamentally different, made up of different things, behave different laws, and uh, they're, they're incompatible with each other, uh, except in the sense that maybe one of them is causing the others to occur. Uh, the, the, it, the, the dualism that, that, that's, that's bugging people today comes from this, this, um, these efforts to solve the hard problem. And, you know, they couldn't figure out how to do it. And then um, the zombieists came in. You know, um, you know, the the so-called P-zombieists, you know, the P-zombies, these are the philosophical zombies. And the argument is this. Well, look, so you can have a zombie. And the zombie has um, no consciousness, no representations, but it has all of the behaviors um, that look like their consciousness. And so, you know, you smack a zombie on the arm and it goes, ouch, that hurt. But it didn't feel anything. It's just mimicking what it knows it's supposed to do because it's a zombie and zombies do that. So Chalmers famously said, well, if you can imagine a zombie, you have a creature that's behaving just like a human being, but it doesn't have consciousness but you have consciousness. 
So if you have consciousness, it's coming from someplace else other than the mechanical, physical, biochemical stuff that you're made up of. Therefore, you have to have another realm of existence, and this is this mental realm. Now, once you've walked through that contaminated door, you're doomed because you're never going to get a science out of this thing. And that's why I am a, a forever enemy of dualism. Fortunately, we don't have to do that. This is not a summer school on human consciousness. It's a summer school on the other minds problem. And, we, and so it's, we're not talking about things that walk like us and talk like us but don't feel a thing. We're not talking about that. We're talking about other organisms. And there you can ask the question, is this organism a zombie? That's what we're asking when we're asking if it's a robot. Can I, can I say the, the magic word, the magic name? J John Searle's Chinese room? <laughs> please let's not get into that. It's completely, it's completely wrong, but please not get into that. We have got into it with Greg when you talked about the hardware and software. What you said about hardware and software would be fine if it were true that humans are um, uh, hardware running software. But if, in fact, we're dynamical systems running water, and here I'm with Beluska on this, then it's not relevant. If, it, if, if, there, if we are not, imp if, if, if the process well, That doesn't is, matter, that's just the substrate, that, that's just a different computation. And a uh, you have a waterfall over here, and you have a simulated computational waterfall over there, and you say they're the same thing? Well, then, what, then let me say one of them is wet and the other one isn't, and the same thing goes for sentience. And that's true. It's all about what you measure, though, from the waterfall, right? Whether you're measuring wetness or whether you're measuring, I don't yeah, know, something. We're talking about wetness, and, and we're talking about whether it's there or it's not there. Is it wet or isn't it? Not, can I interpret it as being wet? Can I project wetness on it? Can I simulate it? Can I simulate its properties? Is it wet? In English, is it feeling something? That's the heart. That's the uh, other mind's problem. Well, but you see, that Searle's argument was, in fact, you don't get wetness. You get the simulation, you get the computations, but you don't get the experience. Searle's argument was against computation. It wasn't against, uh, it, it, it wasn't against any of the other dualisms that we were talking about. It was against computation. He was yeah. saying mental states are not computational states. That's, That's correct. But, but, but the analogous, so this is argument, red herring. It's the analogous argument is that the, 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 the computations that you would uh, take um, to produce a hurricane will not, will not produce any witness. You'll have the computations without the way. It's, it's without the feeling. It's an analog. It yes. It's not. It's not a. We're agreed a, on that. I, I just. We're agreed. We are agreed. How does that happen? It's. It's because the subject was changed inadvertently. <laughs> I, uh, let's go back to the audience. Yeah. Uh, if I could, I'd like to just t take things back briefly uh, to your really uh, interesting question about um, learning and other psychological kinds and plants and prokaryotes. I feel like maybe the case could have been pushed a little harder. Um, one problem I see is that it seems like when we talk about um, these kinds like um, learning or memory or communication, we're talking about something that seems a little bit like a natural kind, um, which philosophers love to talk about. Um, and um, I think Jerry Fodor once said, um, it's the hallmark of natural kinds that they often, that two things that look superficially uh, different actually turn out to be the same. Um, so uh, what's interesting about that is that what it calls for is some account in virtue of which the two things that appear different uh, re really are the same. And um, what, what part of what I took um, that question to be pushing for was some account in virtue of which um, the, th the process, the psychological kind of learning or uh, communication or memory um, is the same in um, human beings, for example, as it is in plants or prokaryotes, even though ostensibly the mechanism is going to be different. Um, and I, I didn't hear, uh, I didn't hear a, uh, much, of a much in the way of a response to that question. So, I mean, it comes back to definitions, I guess. If you want to say all experience-dependent plasticity in any phenotype of an organism is learning, that's a okay definition of learning in my book, and that it includes everything. But in 
it does get more specialized than that. You have the synaptic plasticity of an aplesia. You have other kinds of uh, neural excitability changes. You have new synapses or new neuron growth in more complex animals. And then you have operationally defined kinds of learning and memory like episodic or associative learning or place preference learning. And these things have, are really different from each other at a different level and in ways that are useful to us. So I think these are really semantic distinctions to me. You're, you're counting habituation and sensitization and there is learning mechanisms as I, well. I call those a form of learning, yeah, yeah. sure. Hi, it's really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, most, like all the experiences that are done on animals to prove sentience and are done on uh, plants and microbes and stuff. So uh, I'm wondering, like, is there... Um, Anything that, and I like the, if we do the same experiments on a computer, on AI, like is there anything that they, the AI could not do if it's programmed for it? It's, it's hard for me to find a good example. I mean, of course, we don't know exactly what the limits are for what we can do with machines. Uh, personally, I don't think there is a limit. Like, I think we'll have machines indistinguishable from you and me in the next 10, 20 years, whatever the number is. Um, so if that's, you know, if that's our definition of the extent to which machines can do stuff, it's pretty hard to say there's an experiment to distinguish them. But I think even today on pretty simple machines, you know, some robots that, you know, fly all around my lab or swim underwater, there are already a lot of very interesting phenomenologies that look like learning and, well, they are learning, I think, in any uh, computational definition of learning. And yeah, so I, I, I think, I think there's, it, that's going to be a tough one to find things they can't do. I'm wondering, I'm wondering about uh, sentience, and you said like the uh, Monsieur Arnaud that there were no uh, degrees of sentience or or something like that. But it seems like the if we take an analogy with consciousness, like there's the subconscious mind and the conscious mind. Like, wouldn't it be like the same? Like, with that, some levels of sentience are uh, subconscious or are not um, are not there as much. There's two things. One of them is really bad. Forget about subconscious mind and, that's, and, and conscious mind. There are unconscious processes, unfelt processes, and felt processes. That's all. And most processes going on in your head are not felt. So forget about that. But about degrees of sentience, it's like talking about degrees of livingness. Something either is a living system or it isn't, presumably, except for viruses. And I'm not going to talk about the real borderline cases, but in general, across the phylogenesis, all the living systems are living. You can't say this one is more living than that is. They, they are different. And so if, if they're sentient, they may, sentient means that they feel. So they feel different things. There, as I said, there are some people that, people that are colorblind. They can't s feel what it feels like to look at red because they can only see whatever they see. But that's not a degree of sentience. That sentience, it's there, a perfectly 100% sentient creature with different qualitative experiences, more intense, less intense, more varied, less varied. Don't call that degrees of sentience unless you want to call, talk about degrees of livingness. I don't see why that's a problem, though. I mean, we have degrees of consciousness. I think we can say people are semi-conscious. You know, usually before I've had my first coffee, the level of consciousness that I experience is lower than, than later in the day. And it's I think like level of alertness. It's not, it's not degree of sentience. It's just level of I know of it's alertness. not the same thing, but I'm not sure why the same kind of argument couldn't apply to sentience, yeah. especially if sentience is a composite of many types of uh, behavior or performance characteristic at once. If I start talking louder and louder and louder, right? There's something increasing in intensity, but I wouldn't call it a different degree of sentience. I would agree that talking louder is not a different degree of sentience, but that doesn't seem to argue that in principle, the notion of different degrees of sentience couldn't be something we can agree on just in the, cause, because, you know, as we move forward and we have this you know, if we don't want to, I don't want, I don't, it doesn't make me happy to think of bacteria being sentient. And that's a subjective thing. I, I can't really argue that very rationally, I think. But, but if I'm willing to make that assertion, then I'm going to end up either making an arbitrary breakpoint if I don't find some immersion phenomenon or, or a phase transition, or we're going to end up with a degree. So can I expand your question on robotics? Because I think that's quite interesting. 
what would you think it would take? So under what conditions do you think it would benefit robots to be sentient? And what kind of mechanisms would you have to implement? I mean, if I knew that, I would I already have my Nobel Prize. <laughs> Aside from the fact that there isn't any computer science that or robotics. That might not be the but, worst way of thinking about it. If that, but I mean, I think that's what our entire community is chasing. You know, what are the set of attributes that let us build a system which is sentient or intelligent, if we want to use that word, or things like that? And I think it's been, I mean, so we're all chasing that, our, our community, but I don't think there's any uh, clear signal on the immediate horizon that we'll be able to define those terms well enough to say what we have them or don't have them. Well, but could you, I mean, building on things we've heard earlier, say that that one critical ingredient might be self-replication and fitness. At the point where you have that, would it come, would sentience come automatically at some point? I mean, it ends up being very subjective. For me, I would say no. My, you know, I think many people, including me, seem to be of the feeling that there's a large set of attributes and this, the particular set of them are not well-defined, but there are many of them. And as you build systems that have more and more of those attributes, people are more and more willing to call those things sentient or intelligent or you know, use various words in that large equivalence class. And I think we're getting to the point now where people use those words, in, at least in regular parlance, fairly often, not, mostly journalists, but not only journalists. Um, so I think we're crossing some threshold societally, but, but I don't think it's, I, I, for me, it's not self-replication. I mean, there are people trying to build self-replicating machines, which are more curiosities than anything else, but that's not it. I mean, if, I, if I'm sterilized on the way home tonight, I don't think I'm gonna lose my sentience. There's, get, get, there's uh, a <laughs> dicey issue there. Um, there's a, anybody notice something interesting about the last five or ten minutes? Everybody's talking about intelligence, and they're talking about sentience, they're talking about thinking, and they're talking about decision making. Nobody's talking about motivation, desire, need, love, hate. The a whole affective domain tends to be just razored out of this discussion and moved away. And I think one of the reasons is that these other emotional components feel very analog. They don't feel digital. They don't feel like the sort of thing that's going to be captured by the digital devices that you folks work with. And so they tend not to be part of the discussion. And I find that really fascinating because when you start thinking about sentience, from my perspective, which means you go back to the very beginning, it's all driven by emotion. It's all emotion. You learn this because you're going to get food. You learn to avoid that because you get away from something that's painful and aversive. You communicate with someone else because you're in distress and you need another colony of bacteria to make adjustments in its metabolic rates to, so that you can survive. And this is, these are the foundation events that occur in the very most primitive forms of organisms, most basic species of all. And that's the key component. So when I say sentience, which is again, why I don't want to define it, and why people jump on me when I, when I say I don't want to, it's because I want to incorporate all of these elements of life. And I want it to come down to, I want to do, play the Tom Nagel game. There is something it is like to be a bacteria. And it includes all of these components, all of these functions, and all of these affective states. And computational programs are not going to capture it. I don't think they were, well, I hate ever. Don't ever say ever because you'll just turn out to look like a fool, but it looks pretty improbable to me. I think uh, Lars brought up a good point though in a way of thinking about it. If, if sentience or consciousness, if we want to describe what they are, uh, it'd probably be a good idea to figure out what they're for. What function do they serve for? For organisms? And I think it's not going to be the same answer for every organism. Every organism lives in its own unique sort of sensory environment, its own umwelt, its own set of priorities. And so therefore the, the feelings and kinds of sentience that are going to help it survive, that are going to be adaptive for it, are going to be very different. And I think that's something we also haven't talked about very much is like, sure, it feels like something to be a person or a bat or a bacterium, um, but what's that for? What good is that? That's called, that is called the hard problem, not the other mind's problem. The hard problem is fine organisms feel What's it, what's it for? That's the hard problem. There are three questions Thank burning you. to be asked. Don't, didn't you want to ask? You did? Okay, go ahead. 
Um, so I think one of the hallmarks of sort of the, the, the way many people have a thinking of consciousness, sentience, intelligence, using our own sort of human introspection as a model is it's very individuated. Um, and I think humans, more than a lot of other species, certainly more than like social insect, insects, for instance, have a very endogenous hormonal and neurotransmitter experience as opposed to, say, plants where you have a lot of stuff that's exuded, uh, insects where you have a lot of stuff that's sort of put in the air. And so I'm wondering to what degree that sort of, to what degree is the fact that uh, our species has this very, very endogenous locked in experience of those chemical signals uh, influence the degree to which we experience a very private um, sense of self, sense of being there, as opposed to like, would say a bee have more of a sense of I'm in this corner of we rather than I'm me. And even like in mammals, I remember reading dolphins don't just see their own echoes, they see the echoes from the clicks of the other members of the pod. And so they would have like a richer sensory experience if they're with other members clicking. So I'm just wondering if certainly in the social insects, but also in robots maybe, like how do you, how do you code the individuation of the robot's sensory motor position? Uh, how does this sort of inner outer uh, representation play into that sense of self or whatever analog you use for the, for the robots? Um, I think, to my knowledge, there, there are no hormones that are uniquely human. So the, the, the inner chemical world, is it, there's nothing uniquely human about it. Um, the first hormone systems, by the way, were discovered in insects. Um, they, they were related to development. That was even before the hormones of the human female estrogen cycle and so on were discovered. Um, so there's a rich hormonal world in, in, in insects just as well as in mammals. So I don't think there is much of a difference there. You're right that there is a, that there are various forms of chemical communication in the insects, but that's, I don't think it marks out the insects as unique because there are all kinds of, as we've heard earlier, all kinds of sensory communication mechanisms that are unique to a variety of species all across the, the living systems, basically. So I don't think there's anything especially humans about um, having these modulatory systems that mediate emotions and, and, um, and states and so on. But there might be a, a difference with robotic systems. That I don't know. I don't, I, there are many mechanical systems. Many people have looked at building robots and, for example, work in a herd or a collective or, you know, depending on how big it is, a swarm. People use different words. And they measure one another's position and they, they move collectively. But, you know, I don't think they're very interested in, interesting um, from a philosophical or conceptual point of view. They, you know, they use a different algorithm to measure where they are, emulating fish or cows or birds or just some cooked up thing. But really, they're kind of simple computational artifacts that I don't think they, I don't think that they're sophisticated enough in general to say anything super interesting. Um, I think the more interesting question for me is when I go to a, you know, soccer game in a stadium and I supplement my ego in that giant crowd and move as part of that, what does that say about the change in my notion of self? And that's nothing robotic and nothing I'm expert enough to talk about, but it is a very different percept of the world. Hello. Um, I think the best sign of uh, sentience, as I said earlier this week, would be survival instinct. And I could, I would have a hard time imagining a computer caring about being turned on or off. And under what circumstances would the computer start worrying about it? We get back into these John Searle kinds of things, right? Like, you know, I mean, uh, which I think was dismissed a little bit, but uh, you know, there, there's a, there's a sorry, deserve to, be. deserve to be I think, but there's a road we could go down there where you know you think you know we can build computer programs that can emulate those sorts of behaviors. Are they really experienced anything? Are they sentient? No, I don't think so. Not not the simple ones you can build. But by the way, I'm not sure if every insect really worries about that about it that much either. Right? When a bee bites me because I came near its hive, it's sacrificing its life. I don't think it's got a lot of personal sense of survival. The hive as an entity 
does, but the B doesn't, I guess. Well, well, I'm, well, outside, yeah. I'm, I'm in the wrong area again. So I, <laughs> um, yes, so I think um, the, the first evidence for a modulatory pain system in insects is exactly from honeybees. Um, honey, so there are about 30,000 species of bees, only a, a few dozen of them are social, and the honeybee is one of them. Honeybees are fairly unique in, in indeed sacrificing themselves for the colony and um, they flood their, their system with painkiller before they attack you. But that um, so they're, they mine. Sorry? It doesn't mean they mine. Well, it means that there is a default response that would normally try to get away from you and, and, uh, and avoid that sort of self-amputation and that there's a modulatory system that ameliorates that effect, basically. It, it may be altruism for the rest of the colony. Well, it certainly is altruism for the rest of the colony, but that's arguing at a different level. We're now talking about the mechanistic underpinnings of nociception at the basic level and the pain modulatory system, which is related to the question of sentience. The ultimate evolutionary question is a, is a different level. Uh, just want to say this fascinating panel. Um, uh, I want to ask, I'm not entirely sure why we should be so concerned about a kind of an emergentist dilemma. Um, there's been many answers to why consciousness would emerge. Um, and I think about like the kind of emergentist literature on consciousness itself. So if we look at things like clocking behavior, for example, we know from uh, modeling this on computers that we just need each individual in the flock to follow three different rules. And then we get something like flocking behavior that it emerges. So why can't we say that um, sentience is something like this. Um, you need these three sets of processes and then consciousness emerges from it. Um, and you mentioned Dan Dennett a bunch and he's an answer to this question. He says consciousness emerges with language. I don't necessarily agree with this, but we, this is a perfectly coherent, respectable um, idea for where consciousness could emerge. Yeah, but that's, he, Dan doesn't have a, uh, a biochemical, neurological uh, explanation of it. Uh, the problem with the emergent, emergentism is that um, it's a complicated issue. It's a scientific issue. It's an empirical issue. Um, philosophers have a bloody good time with it. But the bottom line is you're going to ultimately need to identify what the mechanisms involved in producing sentience. And my argument, I don't know anybody on the panel agrees with me or not, my argument is the best scientific stance to take, the one that's most likely to be tractable, to uh, produce a, a viable, testable outcome is the one that says start at the beginning. Start with the assumption that sentience emerges with life. It is coterminous with life. And now start working on the origins of life issues and start working on the biochemical components that are involved in this. It's very complicated stuff. It took billions of years to pull this little puppy off. And so it's not going to be easy, but it certainly is a better place to look from my point of view. It's kind of, and this is a funny thing, but it's the old joke, you know, you, you, you lost your keys, you know, and so, you know, you gotta, you're, you're looking to find them. It's out on the street somewhere. And someone says, well, why don't you look under, you know, the bushes because it's, you know, it's it, maybe they bounced over there. And I'm saying, well, let's look under the lamppost first because that's where it's likely that, well, if they're there, we're gonna, we're gonna find it much more easily there. It'll be crystallized there and, um, so I'm putting this forward as, as a, a, a hypothesis that a few others have hinted at, but no one's actually come out and pushed it hard. I think emergentism is a bigger problem from an empiricist scientific point of view than most philosophers think. So. The, the way, the way um, Art puts it in his article is a little bit closer to a comprehensibility than the form it's taken now. What he said was the emergentist who's trying to explain the origin and functions of sentience, uh, who, who if, if there are lots of species that have it and the lots of species that don't have it, then he's gonna have to explain it lots of times, especially if it happened lots of times. Whereas uh, his solution is it happened only once and it happened at the origin of life. That would be a terrific solution if he were right, it's because it has all of the other po po properties that, that make it a non-problem. But the question is, is he right? 
Stephen, I've been playing this game for about 50 years. I am prepared to be wrong. You can't be a good scientist if you're not prepared to be wrong. Okay, but if you're wrong, then there is no emergent dilemma. We're, de we're defending a dilemma that doesn't exist. If we're talking about what we like, wouldn't it be much nicer if it emerged more than once? Just as I wish life arose many times, it would show how important it is and how fundamental it is. And it would give us a better chance to explain what it was for if we saw it, in, if that, saw it happen under different yeah, conditions. Yeah, and there certainly are many computational phenomena where there's some you know, phase transition between something being possible and being impossible or occurring and not occurring. And so that, that sort of dichotomy uh, as a function of evolution doesn't seem necessarily problematic in and of itself. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I don't, Stephen. What 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 is this for thing you keep bringing up? For yeah, life isn't for anything. Uh, <laughs> I mean, look how many listen, billions of uh, years. Let me put on, look let how me, many billions of year, of years we went without it. I mean, it just it's not for anything. It's an, it's the aliens could have come down once every million years, and it would have been thousands of millions of years of visits before they would have seen anything. It's not for It's anything. not a mysterious no, for. I, let, let me pretend I'm Mike for a moment. I'm a behaviorist. Everything is behavior, right? So I can right. say, I've got this gadget. It's a nematode. It can do this. How does it do it? Let me see. It's got that neuron. What's that neuron for? That's all. That's all I mean by what okay. it's for. No, but the, that question only disappears if you indeed see sentience as synonymous with life. Then you can say, well, life isn't for anything. But... I think they are different. I think most likely sentience emerged later than life, and then you've got a question to answer. The question is, it's a biological trait. What's it for? What, 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 what benefit is it for the, the organism that carries it, and how can you get away without it? Before like, you answer, answer, that's the hard problem. Right. My, my, no, posi my position hard. on no, this, no. and by the way, uh, uh, Frantisek can jump in too, because I believe we're in agreement when this is, um, you can't survive without sentience. An organism that doesn't have subjectivity, that doesn't have feelings, can't survive. It has to be able to detect those things which are toxic and get away from them. It has to be able to know what is nutritious and what is not. No, it does not have to have knowledge. It has awareness. to have subjective experience in order to react appropriately and to survive in a hostile environment which is what it's living in. So from my perspective, you cannot have a purely mechanical system operating here that displays the behavioral components of sentience. Steven shares the same, what I think, um, a problem that Dan Dennett does, and that they can't, get, they can't let loose with the behaviorism of their early, their, their, their intellectual toilet training. Uh, I would like just to comment on this, what I already showed in my talk, this uh, anesthetics, and Bernard was defining life, what can be anesthetized is living, what not is not living. So this sensitivity to anesthetics is also one of the feature. And if you are under anesthesia, and you are not care, take, taking care by the person all around you, you will not survive. So you, without your consciousness, you will be not able to react if there is sudden fire, you will be just burned in this room, lying on the bed, and you would be not able to respond properly to sudden, sudden changes in environment. So you must be online, you must be having sentience, and somehow you must have some consciousness like feature. No, sorry, we, uh, I think we're confusing any form of adaptive response with consciousness. Another issue. For, from my point of view, it, there is no adaptation without consciousness. That's my point of view. You are not able to adapt properly without having all the access to all the information in a manner which is related to the context. Okay, but, but, but you if agree you think about that simple a... mechanisms or computational mechanisms as well, things like cellular automata, in both those domains, robotics, algorithms, it's easy to imagine things that are not conscious and thus I would say not sentient as well, by the way. And they still res they still learn and respond, and and that's I mean if we if we accept that if we say those are intelligent or sentient or then the term becomes um, not useful to me anymore. Would it help Lars if we called it subjectivity? No. Just stick with. Can I can I ask you. Lars? <laughs> he's it, he's rolling his eyes. He's looking upward to the left, which is they tell me a sign of of deep intellectual. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
If we call it subjectivity, are you, are you happier? Well, how, how do you define subjectivity? It if it, you if have it, a feeling. You have an experience. So it's there. It's well, it, it, oh, it, here, try it. It has, it has, va it has valence. Okay. It has, it has, but, it has, but is there an awareness element in the feeling? So absolutely. no one, I think, has an issue with stating, for example, that a bee or a wasp is aggressive rather than it's just flying by and visiting flowers. There's a different kind of state. But there is still a difference between that and saying the wasp is aware that it's a bit in an angry mood today. So that, that's the, that's, I, that's I can, I can, the I can question of whether it's a subjective I, experience I, I becomes can interesting. Appreciate At some level, because sensors never reflect an, an direct physical features of the environment, any experience is subjective. But at okay. that level, it's trivial. You're, you're asking, first of all, about what the motivational state of, of the wasp might be. I'm, the way I'm sort of raising this is what happens if, if the, the wasp, you know, suddenly breaks its legs, does it hurt? Uh, and it doesn't. But, and, and, but I also want to push it. I'm, I'm looking back at the zebrafish uh, uh, experiments uh, where the same kinds of issues come up, right, Carol? Carol, go ahead. Yeah, well, if I may respond to uh, what has been going on in the discussion earlier. So, especially about this issue of sentience and what it is all about. Um, in a way, by saying that all organisms are sentient, however you want to define it, I mean, uh, I'm not sure whether you have explained or resolved any problem with doing that. I think you've just replaced uh, a set of problems by another one. Because what you would have to explain is why animals are different and what creates the differences in experiences between animals, which are very obvious when you do, when you compare different species. So, I mean, in a way, you might have resolved it philosophically by saying uh, bacteria or life started with having sentience. But the question is, I mean, it's, I, I guess it's undeniable that the sentience of bacteria, whatever it might be like, is very different from that of oral organisms. So what you would need to explain after that is how it varies between species. So what have you resolved by calling bacteria sentient? Well, it, it's... All of the differences between species ultimately are going to need to be explained because they're, they're manifestly obvious and, and you can't escape them. The, the question really is, um, back to natural kinds, the fellow gentleman over here asked about natural kinds before. Um, what I'm arguing here is that they are all of a single kind. They are all of a single type. There are vast numbers of tokens of that type. They differ dramatically from each other. I mean, the whole field of comparative physiology and comparative ecology and comparative psychology is looking at the differences between species, when they emerge, how they emerge, what relationships they have to each other, what are the underlying mechanisms from which they bridged, uh, uh, they branched. I mean, all of evolution is, is, is a, a cluster of these similar kinds of problems. All I'm suggesting is there's a different research strategy to take here, and it's one that has powerful entailments to it. It, it. it is, again, I'll repeat, it's a much more tractable problem to put on the table to try to solve than the other cluster of problems that people are trying to deal with now. And the resolution of it, if it, come, if it comes out as I suspect it will, will produce a brand new explosion of ideas, interests, theories, models, and the understanding of relationships among the different species. So it's, it's in some ways, it's, it's an argument that has a scientific grounding to it, but it's also an argument that has philosophical implications to it as well. So that's why I push it. So it's my idea, I like it. What can I tell you? Yeah, it's fine. So, but uh, at the same time, I mean, it does require you to define very specifically what the sentience of a bacterium is. And, uh, and I think that's the challenge. So how would you do that? How would you ground that Just scientifically? One quick thing, my, my, my friend Dennis, Dennis Bray, uh, this, is, this is, in the age of the internet, is a friend I never met. 
uh, but we, we exchanged a lot. He, he told me, he said some years ago, like 10, 12 years ago now, he was considering the possibility of a conscious amoeba. And he was giving a presentation to a group of generalists and he let it slip that he thought this might be a legitimate position. He was assaulted from all sides, <laughs> uh, critiqued uh, uh, to the point where he, he felt just totally intimidated. And when he finished his next book, he considered this issue and he said, nope, they're not conscious. And when we had these exchanges back and forth, I asked him, I said, what was the issue? What turned you around? He said, I finally decided I wasn't gonna be intimidated by those bastards. They were, they were just firing a criticism at me that I was crazy, that doesn't make any sense, this is a radical argument, you don't need to do this, why are you doing this? We have our science over here, we're comfortable, we're happy, and, and he backed off. And I did too, in my 93 book. I considered this issue and I backed off it. And I reproduced a paragraph in the new book saying, hey, this is where I was before. Now, this proposal seems to me so obvious that it would be insane to deny its fundamental truth. But I'm not denying it. I'm just asking you, how would you test it? Oh, How would you gracious. put it to a scientific You know how test? I'm going to test it? How would you prove I'm, that I'm, it's bacterium I'm going to sit at my desk at my computer in Point Roberts where there's no thing around but forest and quiet and the border with Canada, and I'm going to encourage my friends in the microbiological world to start taking a good, hard look at this issue. Greg, last word on this. In the so I got to say, there's two things that make me very uncomfortable. It's an ill-defined word, and it's emotionally loaded. And those two things together just seem very dangerous. And, and, and in some sense, I have to say, kind of contrary to the rules of doing good science, although it's a, it's a very interesting position, but I don't, it just, that seems, again, I, emotionally loaded and ill-defined. And by the way, I think bacteria are trustworthy. I'd like to introduce that as a new concept for us to debate. It's got the same set of problems. Okay, thank you very much. And I want to thank all the panelists. Without agreement, we managed to produce a stimulating panel. Thanks.